Senior Center, and I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Sharp Again Naturally organization. We have Lisa Finer here and Jackie Bishop, and they're going to talk about preventing Alzheimer's and reversing dementia. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Do you want to be quiet? No. So. So how many people here know someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia? Cool. So quite a lot. Got it. And how many of you have wondered about your own memory and cognition? <laughs> Anybody not? Yes. <laughs> Good genes. Don't forget, but no. Yeah, it's great. So, um, you've come to the right place. We are, um, uh, we were formed because some extraordinary filmmakers had found out that there were people who had reversed Alzheimer's and dementia, reversed those, those diagnoses, and gotten their lives back. And they decided to make a film. And we overheard a conversation with those filmmakers and were just riveted by it. And that's how we started. And what we want to do today is to uh, show some of the raw footage. We, we, we got started to help them finish the film because they used all their own money up and uh, they needed help. So uh, what we have are uh, clips from the film and then we're going to tell you something about how these people got better. So I've totally gone off script. So Jackie, do you want to just tell people why you got involved? Like what your personal story is? Yeah. Uh, my mother uh, was diagnosed in 99, but she actually had been having memory problems, I would say for about 18 years by the time she died. And we could have given her just about anything you could give her, but nobody had any anything to suggest. So we took that long slide together, and it was heartbreaking, just heartbreaking. And uh, my mother was an artist and an athlete and a funny party girl. I, I mean, she was a she was cool. And uh, so I wanted to be able to do something that would. Uh, make a difference for other people that I couldn't make with her. So that's what I'm doing here. And um, I've been involved with elders for 20 years. I've been a board member over at Sarah Newman Center in the Maranek, which is a nursing and rehabilitation facility, and uh, have volunteered there and have just retired there as their chairman of the board. And I'm also a holistic health coach a health and life coach. And so I became very interested in what was being done in terms of finding out that there were people who actually had regained cognition. I thought that was pretty incredible. I mean, you never hear that that can happen. As a matter of fact, you're told exactly the opposite, that really, once you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, it's sort of like a slow road down, you know? So, um, I, I was intrigued, and the more I've learned, you know, the more I've really wanted to get involved. So we're gonna we're gonna share with you today a lot of information. Um, it may seem overwhelming, and if it does, you we we hope you'll ask questions, and we hope that you'll be interested in receiving our newsletter to just stay up to date on what it is we're also learning, you know, we're kind of all in this together. So, just briefly, many of you already probably know this, but dementia, what, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So dementia is like the umbrella term of slow cognitive um, dysfunction, which is really has a pro progressive decline. And Alzheimer's disease is considered to be the most common cause of dementia. It, it's a subset. Um, and that is distinguished by the plaques and tangles that are found in the brain. 
Although I will say that not everyone who has plaques and tangles in the brain actually suffers from Alzheimer's disease. So that's, it's, it's an interesting field. We're learning a lot every day. So today we wanted to share with you who we are and why we're here and show you this screening of the film clips, which I think you'll be very interested in, of um, patients, their doctors, their caregivers, some, uh, some researchers as well, talk you through what these reversible causes are, these, these factors that we have found can be tested for and treated, and then take your questions and answers. So, oh, and last but not least, um, we'll share with you a little bit about Sharp again, naturally, and our mission, and um, what our program and next steps are. And also what you might want to do to help and stay connected. We're passing around a, um, we're passing around a list for you to sign up, and especially if you're on email or you know somebody who's on email, um, you can put their name down, we'll connect with them, and uh, make sure that they, when we send out a newsletter, you can get that, whether you're, or, uh, you're around us or not. Okay. Okay, so, should we do the film first? Um, okay. That's the, the logo of the filmmakers, the one in the middle. Right, Health Advocates Worldwide. Um, okay, uh, I've already actually covered that. Okay, wait a And, you know, it's, it is important to say that we are not medical professionals. Um, we have heard this information, we have learned about it, there's a lot of research out there really to support everything that we're going to tell you today. So it's not just something that we've conjured up. But we're, we're not doctors. And so we actually are also educating the medical community about what we have found and are working with them. But we encourage you to talk to your doctor about some of the things that we're <coughs> going to be presenting to you today. Thinking my memory become crystal clear. I can think, I can function, and I feel at peace. It's been declared that Alzheimer's has no cure. The truth is, in many cases, there is a cure, but most people don't know about it. Hard to believe? We have proof. I'm Alex Hedges. And I'm Patricia Tomasi. We found dozens of people across the country with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia who got their minds back. So we decided to make a documentary film. We need your help to finish the film and tell the world. Here is some of our footage. I had no mind. I couldn't process anything and my retention was a second and a half. Disability was given to me within two hours. The assessment was made. I failed every test, and my IQ was 57. I was mild and retarded. I remember one day that I needed to go to a job site over by the astronaut in Houston, and I couldn't go because I couldn't put together in my mind the rules I needed to take to get there. Very confusing. And you think you're saying the right thing. And later, somebody that knows you will tell you that what you said really wasn't so good. Prior to a visit, they had had her on Menenda, which is an Alzheimer's drug, which actually made her worse. She had already become somewhat better from the coconut oil therapy. It was even worse. And he was asking me the same question over and over again, and I'd answer it, and I'd say, Tom, don't you remember they just asked me that? And then we went to the doctor and had a CAT scan and it showed he had early Alzheimer's. There are a whole host of brain diseases that are linked to mercury epidemiologically. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, MS, autism, and acrodynia are all brain diseases that they're, they're all linked to mercury. Many patients come into me and say, well, my other dentist said there's no research, there's no science behind the problem with mercury fillings. They say there's nothing wrong with it. The ADA has proof that it's safe. Well, the, the real truth is there is no proof of safety. 
those that were on a high space of fire rate versus the ones that had the improvement memory, improvement cognition, improvement well-being. This time I became a 13-year-old high school student, and I did not know my wife again. This time I retrograded in 48 years of my life. My entire adult life had been eradicated. I said, I don't care what any of you guys say. That was a drug reaction, and it was due to my Lipitor, and that's what triggered my research into the statin drug use. Basically, I'm speaking to two audiences. One is the people in the streets, people at the grassroots level, who have the power to reverse Alzheimer's disease in their own homes, on their own, without the need of medical assistance. But the second group I'm talking to are the medical doctors and the scientists who have the power to study this, have the power to facilitate the process and aid their patients in overcoming Alzheimer's disease. And so that's why my um, PowerPoint presentations are so technical and so scientific is because I want these people to understand the realities that there's science underneath this approach. It's been a, a, a great um, story to have my mother back. And, um, and people, uh, all her family and friends are saying the same thing. She's the back. I started to think again, and I started to be able to write again. After the supplementation, I, my brain woke up. After about three months, I started noticing clearing of my mind. When Alzheimer's started on me, I didn't go to the doctors with it. My mother went to the doctor, and they never even slowed it down. And luckily, I was able to do it. It was just like watching a dead flower. You know, get watered and start to come back. My brain just came back. When he got better, it was such a relief. I had my husband back. According to science, I shouldn't be here. I'm privileged to be alive every day and enjoy life. So that just gives you a little taste of what we've been learning about. Okay, so we want to share with you, um, first, let's go back to the mission of Sharp again, naturally, Jackie. Um, So we're here to educate the public and the medical community about multiple causes of dementia and the need to identify and treat those that are reversible. We understand that perhaps not all dementia or all Alzheimer's disease is reversible, but many cases are. And that's really what we're here to do. Um, so what we found, and I'll tell you a little bit about my own, my own experience with my dad, but many people are misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's or even dementia. There are other things that can mimic these diseases. Cognitive impairment and disorientation can be caused by the factors we're going to share with you. And until these things are tested for and treated, no one will ever really know um, if a particular case is curable or not. Okay, so you saw these people in the film um, quickly. You've heard a little bit of their stories. We're going to slow this down for you a little bit and give you the background. So, how did they get their cognition back? So, possible causes of dementia to test for are, number one, mercury and heavy metals poisoning. Now, you know, you may think, you know, what are we talking about, heavy metals? Well, in our environment today, over the last 50 or 60 years in America, growing up near coal plants and having silver fillings made of mercury put in your mouth, um, and eating fish, 
that used to be safe, but now all fish has mercury in it and, and other chemicals. Now, the smaller fish are better for you than the larger ones, but most of our fish, unfortunately, is contaminated. I still eat fish, so I'm not telling you not to eat fish. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's understanding why these things are happening. So Denise, you saw her in the film, she was a flight attendant, and for cosmetic reasons, she had a mouthful of fillings. And she didn't want silver fillings, she wanted her teeth to be white. So unfortunately, she got them all out at once, which is very dangerous, and she didn't go to a specialist who knows how to remove them safely. And what can happen, in her case, what did happen, is that the mercury gets dislodged and starts to find its way into the tissues in the body. And so very quickly, she started to lose her memory because mercury in the body is toxic. It's a neurotoxin. So she had to receive IV chelation. She had a friend who said, I'm gonna take you to an alternative doctor. They found out that she had high levels of mercury. There are ways for you to detoxify yourself. It's called chelation. Um, she changed her diet because diet can also influence cognitive function. And today, she is functioning fairly well, um, working part-time. So she told you she had an IQ of 54. You know, she was mildly retarded, and here she is. She's regained much of her ability to, to function um, normally. Tom Warren is the husband of Louise, who you saw speaking, and he was diagnosed at 53 with early on uh, Alzheimer's. Diagnosed both at the Mayo Clinic and at a Seattle hospital. His scan, his brain scan, showed actual frontal lobe shrinkage. So he tried a lot, of, he did a lot of research on it. He had lucid moments, and in his lucid moments, he would go through books and he would mark them, and then when his wife came home, she's a pharmacist, she would go through and read what he had bookmarked. And together, they learned about enzymes, and they learned about supplements, and they learned about eating better foods, but he, he was a little better, but not much better. And then they learned about fillings, these mercury fillings, and how these heavy metals can affect the body. So he had a mouthful of fillings, and he opted to have them taken out, his teeth taken out, and replaced with dentures. Not everybody has to do that. He's the only one I've ever heard of who did do that. It's just that they figured it didn't take so long to do it safely. And he was scared about losing his mind. He said, I care more about my mind than my teeth. Mm -hmm. So the, don't, that's not what everybody has to go. And he had been suffering already for many years. So he had a dentist who agreed to do that. And wouldn't you know, within one month, his symptoms started to really turn around, really change. And he lived 20 more years, he wrote two books, and you remember that scan I told you about of his brain? The shrinkage had actually reversed, and his frontal lobe was normal after ridding the body of that mercury. Jessica, she's a young, she's a lawyer, she's got young children, and in her 40s, she was very disoriented and was vacuuming the house having left her baby on the changing table and knew she had a major problem. So she was diagnosed 97% certainty of having Alzheimer's, early Alzheimer's. This is a young, beautiful woman in her 40s. They tested her for heavy metals and off the charts, very high, and she was treated, had her fillings replaced, did chelation, and she was able to return to practicing law. So you've seen all three of these people, they had suffered from this, this heavy metals poisoning, 
And just to let you know how toxic mercury is, it's 50 times more toxic than lead. And it's a neurotoxin, which means that it actually causes your neurons to shrink, shrink back away from that mercury. Um, it's now con considered too toxic for our sewage treatment systems. And when a dentist removes mercury fillings, they have to be treated as toxic waste, as designated by the Environmental Protection Agency. What that means is it has to go into a little metal can, and a special guy with special equipment and clothing picks it up, like with tongs, and disposes of it. And that's the stuff that they are still, about half, to, half of the dentists are still putting it into people's mouths. So that's how they're trained. I mean, it's not anything nasty they're doing. It's just that's what they're trained. So do. the symptoms that these three people and many other people experience in this country, probably around the world, frankly, mimic Alzheimer's disease. But if you can find out that that's what's your issue and you can treat it, then there's a nice likelihood that you'll get some of your cognition back. So this just shows, this may be a little hard to show, but there's a piece of mercury here, and this is the neurofibril here, and it's shrinking back from that mercury. That's okay. And then this, you can barely see it, but here, this is a filling, a 25-year-old filling that once removed was still off-gassing the mercury. There's a little vapor here. And that's what happens over time in your mouth. What, where we once thought that the mercury was inherently stable and didn't move and nothing changed, we learned that it off-gasses and there's vapor. Every time you eat, you brush your teeth, a little bit at a time kind of dislodges and that vapor gets inhaled and absorbed into the body. Yeah, and it's worse if you grind your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so, major, I, I think we've pretty much mentioned what the major sources of mercury poisoning are. It's, it's everything that we've mentioned, the fish, especially the very large predator fish, the tunas, the halibut, Chilean sea bass, sharks, swordfish, um, and, and the environment. I mean, in some places in the country, more than others, you're going to find heavy metals even in, in, in the air particles. Um, so another possible cause of dementia and Alzheimer's diagnoses are low, low th uh, hormones, either thyroid, estrogen. They're different hormones that can, can affect the body. And if you're not getting enough, then you can have mental confusion, you can have cognitive dysfunction. So Helen was a woman featured um, briefly who was a marketing professional and she couldn't write anymore. She didn't really know what was wrong with her, but she knew that she was losing her mind. And she thought after going on the internet and researching it that she somehow had low thyroid, but when she went to her doctor who did the regular tests for thyroid, she said, you're fine. It's not showing up anything with thyroid. But she got so desperate that she followed a thread on the internet and called a woman who had written about her symptoms and said, what should I do? I, I just, I don't even want to live anymore. I mean, that's where it had gotten to. And she said, take your temperature in the morning when you get up and call me. And she took her temperature and it was 92 point four, let's say. It was it was very low. And this woman said, You have a thyroid issue and you need to go to your doctor and you need to ask for these tests. And sure enough, when she had the correct tests, which were more they were more detail oriented, it showed she was dying. Mm -hmm. And they said, Come in right away. They originally put her on Synthroid, which is a pharmaceutical form of thyroid. But Synthroid didn't really help her because there's an active form of thyroid called T3. And Synthroid, when, when you're younger, can convert 
T4 to T3 pretty easily, but as you get older, it can be difficult, or if you are, have a certain constitution, it's not as easy. So she was then put on natural desiccated thyroid, which comes from an animal, and it's much closer to the kind of thyroid that we we need in our bodies. Yeah, and I, she, I want to just say, mm -hmm. I have to have the same test, I just had them, because I've been dragging more and more for about two years, and after being on the natural desiccated thyroid for a week, I felt like myself again. And um, exactly how we're going to get my thyroid back to normal, or if we, or if I'll be on medication for the rest of my life, I don't know that. But I feel good, and my brain's working again. It's like a miracle. So um, it's real. It's, I was really excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have felt very challenged and and you start taking something that's really helping you, you feel like a new person. So anyway, so with Helen, she's active and healthy and, and working again, and we're, you know, we're thrilled. Now this is um, Dr. Chahong Lu. She's actually an MD who was suffering terribly from suddenly poor memory. Like she used to be able to dictate all of her files at the end of the day, all the patients she saw. And it got to the point where she had to dictate right after she saw each patient because she couldn't remember what had transpired in the appointment. So, um, in her 40s, her hormone levels were those of someone twice her age. She was given bioidentical hormones, which restored her memory, and she became a holistic practitioner. She changed her practice and now, uh, now practices and, and teaches. So these people all had low hormones, different ones, but low hormones, which in the body can wreak havoc and cause your brains not to work as optimally as they should. Right. Oh, and bioidentical hormones today, we're, we're thinking they're, they're a good choice. They, they seem to be closest to what we would make ourselves and, uh, and do help people. So, the next uh, area we want to talk to you about are toxins in the food, water, air, and your work and home environment. Paul Barton was featured in the film. Paul has an interesting story in that he watched his mother die of Alzheimer's disease. And when he started experiencing the same symptoms that he saw in his mother, he said, I've got to figure out what's going on. So we give him a lot of credit because Paul didn't finish high school, but he's a very bright man and he went and started reading medical journals, and everything he could put his hands on. And he became knowledgeable, and one day he's sitting there reading something, and he realizes he has no idea what he's just read. Like, he's, he's experiencing the problem of cognitive dysfunction in the moment. And he starts to think back, okay, what, what did I do today? Like, what did I eat? Where did I go? And he traced it, a long story short, he traced it back to frozen custard, which is, I think, like a Carvel or something like that. And for him, that custard had an ingredient in it. It's an artificial vanilla flavoring called vanillin. And that caused him to really lose his, his sense of self and his sense of functioning. Um, literally, he w it would be like you hear these stories about people who go out to drive and then they can't find their way home. That was Paul. So he traced it. He did a lot of research on artificial flavors, colors, sweeteners, and he realized that a lot of these products are chemically derived and... Many from petroleum. Unfortunately, they really are chemicals that have no place in our bodies. They're not helping anything, they're mucking up the works. So he wrote a book and he is 
still alive and, um, sure. and, and doing very well. So what are the things that we're talking about? You know, there's, uh, we're going to put stuff up here and you're going to go, oh no, I mean, I use that, I use that, right? So, but there are things that we just want you to start to become aware of. There are artificial flavors, colors, sweeteners, preservatives. Those things that you read on a label when you go to the supermarket and you have absolutely no idea what they are. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, the Food and Drug Administration categorizes most of these things as generally recognized as safe. But I think we've all been reading the newspaper over the last five years, ten years, and we know that a lot of the things that have been okayed in the past are then found to be not very healthy for us, whether they're drugs or whether they're food products. Yeah. So, so what generally recognized as safe means is that the problems they cause have not yet hit the headlines. <laughs> That's what generally recognized as safe boils down to. So, so other neurotoxins, things that really do affect the brain are pesticides, herbicides, and fluoride. So with regard to the pesticides and the herbicides, I mean, we know that that's the whole thing behind organic food, right? Those foods are not directly sprayed with these chemicals. What's used on them are natural compounds. But we all know that there might be traces. You always have to wash your food. And I always recommend my clients use a, sp a spray. You know those veggie sprays that you see sold in some of the markets and some of the health food stores? I spray everything because it gets off the residual wax and the, and the dust and the whatever chemicals can be on the outside, it helps to get rid of them. So this is a study about food coloring. So we have four mice, two in each cage, and they're able to run through a maze in 20 seconds, both, both sets of mice. They're, they have water in their cages. In one cage, we put food coloring, some drops of food coloring into their water. And these mice, within two days, it takes them 100 seconds to, to go through that maze. So obviously, the food coloring is hampering their ability to navigate and to function. In four days, it doubles again, and then it takes them 200 seconds to get through the maze. So they're really not doing very well. The good news is, which illustrates a lot of what we're talking about today, is that if you take the food coloring back out of their water and give them pure water, they recover. And so within six days, they're back to running through the maze in 20 seconds. And it just shows the power of our bodies to heal once it has the right food, the right you know, beverages and exercise, the things that we always knew we needed. If you, if you give the body that, it will respond. And obviously, for it doesn't matter what color dye we're talking about. The results have always been the same. But this is just one indication of how these kinds of foods, again, can influence how we, how we can function in our lives. Uh, and one thing about this, um, we have some literature here. One of them is a sheet, uh, I think it's green, uh, about a, a, a kind of little cheese cracker, like a cheese its kind of thing. It takes an entire page of single space type to list all the ingredients that go into those uh, little wheat-based, corn-based uh, cheese things. A European version of that, called Cavli, has two ingredients, rye flour, three, rye flour, salt, and water. That's it. There are 11 different colorings in the Cheez-Its, by comparison. Why? So. Anyway, it's possible to get good stuff, and part of what we're doing is to collect uh, information on that so it can be available. But we'll hand those out later. Moving on, the next 
causative factor for Alzheimer's disease and dementia is poor nutrition. And we, we just want to spend a few minutes talking to you about this. Today, you know, I can safely say, being a health coach, that we know that the foods that we're eating and that are grown do not have the same nutrition in them as foods that we were eating 50, 75 years ago. It's partly the soil, it's partly the seeds, uh, the air. There's a lot of things that go into growing food. But unfortunately, we have genetically modified foods today. Um, so a lot of times we need supplementation to keep our bodies healthy. I think we've all heard about vitamin D3, right? We know it's been in the news. Every, you know, people need to take that as a supplement now. We never used to need to do that. Um, we also have too much sugar, starch, and unhealthy fats in our diets. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So this is a woman named Anne who unfortunately got to the point where she couldn't move or speak. Um, she could only drink through a straw. She was immobile and the doctors had sent her home on hospice to die. Fortunately, her son was a nutrition expert and said, I'm going to just try this with my mom. I'm going to juice fruits and vegetables. I'm only going to give her the healthiest nuts, some seeds, you know, blend it up in the blender and let her sip it through the straw. Yeah, and it was mostly just so she could have the pleasure of something that tasted good right. on her way out. And then they sat down to wait for her to die. It was also gluten and dairy free, I might add. Well, within six months, just with that intervention, just with better nutrition, she could speak, she could interact, she could walk, she was back at the stove cooking. And God bless, she is still alive and doing well. So in her case, she wasn't eating the right foods for her, which causes a lot of inflammation in the body. This inflammation, sometimes we can feel it. It with like arthritis. Most people with arthritis can feel that and it hurts. But there's a lot of inflammation that's silent in the body as well. And we know it's caused by certain kinds of foods. So one thing you can do is to have more whole grains. I think you've probably all heard that. You know, not eat um, white rice or uh, you know, a lot of donuts or, or white flour like bagels or that sort of thing. Um, I know, we're <laughs> Steve was holding up the donuts in the back. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but these foods really don't serve us very well. They taste good and they have a lot of sugar in them, which makes us want them because we're addicted to sugar, most of us. I mean, it, it really t makes food taste very good. But unfortunately, it's not doing our bodies a lot of good. They also have gluten-free stuff. It's not as much fun, but <laughs> and believe it or not, a lot of people suffer from dehydration, not getting enough water. Okay, we drink a lot of coffee, we may drink a lot of tea, we may drink a lot of diet soda, also not very good. Diet soda pulls minerals out of your bones as it's being processed in your body. Really the best thing is, is water. If you can maybe put a little lemon in it, make it taste a little better for you. But that really is what hydrates us. So we, we would encourage you to, uh, to drink more water. So one of the things we wanted to mention to you today are healthy fats as opposed to unhealthy fats. And I know that this is a topic that can seem very confusing. So the one thing we want to tell you today is that olive oil is healthy and it's good to cook with. Um, Extra virgin olive oil is to be used without heat. So extra virgin olive oil you can use on your salad dressings, you can put it on top of your soups, you can use it like a, like a condiment, like a sauce. But it doesn't do very well when it's heated at high temperatures, like if you're frying. So if you're frying, you want to use regular olive oil or even the light olive oil because that, those, all of those oils can take a higher heat. 
But also, there's another very healthy oil out there called coconut oil. Now, coconut oil was maligned in the 70s as being, oh, it's a saturated fat and it's going to raise your cholesterol and it's, and it's going to, you know, turn your arteries into lard. I, they said all these things. What we've come to know about coconut oil is that not only is it a healthy oil, but coconut oil provides an alternative energy source for the brain. Okay? This is really important. A lot of people have this insulin resistance, right? They eat a lot of sugar, they're pre-diabetic or they're diabetic, and sugar, glucose, which is the usual brain uh, in the source of, of fuel doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work for the brain either. If it's not working for your body, it's not working for the brain. Coconut oil, a couple of tablespoons a day, can actually help your brain by giving it a different fuel to make it function. So there's a doctor, a neonatal specialist, um, a wonderful doctor down in Florida, Dr. Mary Newport, and she was fine, but her husband was not. And he was suffering from Alzheimer's disease. He had been diagnosed, and he was steadily getting worse. And she did research. You know, here she is. She's a doctor. She's used to doing research. And she found coconut oil and started to put it in his food twice a day. And do you know that Steve regained his cognition? He was, he was able to process the coconut oil as a fuel for his brain, and he became better. And there was a point at which he stopped taking it, and he started to get worse again. So for him, that's what he needed that. So a lot of people today are really dealing with a problem with sugar and insulin resistance, the glucose is not working for them, and these ketones that are found in coconut oil become a good alternative. Right. Um, Penny Cohen, this is another one of our board members, um, she's going to go around and, because you can take coconut oil in a couple of different ways. One is transdermally, through your skin. It is incredibly good for you. It's antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial. Some people really like it. Some people don't like it so well, so if that's a good way for people who don't care for coconut oil. But if you don't like it, there's also a kind of coconut oil where they've taken all the taste out of it, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you want just a little on your skin, you'll see how, how smooth it makes it. And it'll get to your brain through your skin. So. The brand, by the way, many coconut oils do have a slight, or maybe not so slight, coconut flavor, which my husband doesn't particularly love. So there is a brand called Spectrum, um, which is found, you can get at Whole Foods or Mrs. Green's or probably other uh, places, but Spectrum Naturals it has no flavor. So I use that to saute vegetables, uh, my greens, you know, I can use it on toast, you know, I use it like I use margarine or butter. Right, so I think that what you will find is that there's a lot of research that's being done all the time. And for every study that you find, it seems like there's another study that tells you that what the findings were the first time have been reversed or it doesn't really have merit. Part of that are the design of the studies. Part of that is who's paying for the studies. A lot of times the studies are commissioned by the very companies that want to promote their products. So as a consumer, I think it's very difficult to know when you read an article in the newspaper what to make of it. But I thought omega-3s were so good, right? I mean, and suddenly they're not. I think the, the thinking in holistic circles is that omega-3 oils give you essential fatty acids, which the body cannot make themselves. And so they are a source of a nutrient that many people need. 
Um, flax oil also is an omega-3 oil. Um, you really can't access the flax unless it's ground up. Um, if you eat the whole seeds, it's great for your uh, digestion. It kind of keeps things moving, but you're not getting the omega-3 oils that way. So they have to be ground up. But they sell it ground up too. Um, yeah, but you don't really want to do it that way. You can soak them and then stick them in a blender. If you have a blender, just stick it in or a blender. Or a grinder, like a spice grinder. There are lots of you can sell them. In, yes, they sell them in capsules as well. There, there are plenty of ways to, to get your, your supplements. Um, I had mentioned vitamin D earlier, magnesium. These these whole food multivitamins today are a good a good source of vitamins. You know, just to kind of keep your baseline healthy um, in case you're not eating so great, right? Or and avoiding processed foods. Um, I just want to say a word about this. You know, the f foods that are found in boxes in the center of the supermarket, on the shelves, by and large, are not the foods that our body knows how to process well. They just aren't. They have chemicals in them, typically. They have um, ingredients that will extend their shelf life. But they're not typically foods that the body will process really well. So I encourage you to read labels and to be aware that a lot of our food today is genetically modified. That's, that's okay. This is the list of ingredients for um, cheese it duos. And um, that's that. And here's the European version. Okay, so if, I'm just going to show you the side of the box that has an inch and a half of ingredients for these crackers. Many of them are not natural and have artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, yellow dye, um, actually three different kinds of yellow dyes. Uh, you know, we, I could go on, but it, it just tells you that putting this in your body is not going to help it run properly. Um, something like a, a cobbly or a flatbread that literally has two or three ingredients is much healthier. I just encourage you to read labels and if you want a little bit of a primer, you can pick one of these up and just read about some of these ingredients and which ones are not particularly helpful. Okay, so I had mentioned also, re replace, dr replace drinks that are pulling the water out of your body. You know, anything with caffeine will pull water out of your body. So they say like for every, every eight ounce glass of caffeinated drinks that you have a day, so let's say you have two cups of coffee, you need to be drinking four glasses of water. Because it's pulling, it, it's not, you're not only um, getting rid of the eight ounces of the coffee, but you're getting rid of the other fluid that's being pulled out of your body. So in order to really replace it, now I know a lot of people don't love drinking water. You know, I'm probably, like I was the poster child for don't make me drink just water. Like I couldn't, but you know, I was adding lemon to it, and over time, you know, it's like anything else. The more you do something, the more you get used to it. And I knew, see, because I had, I had been trained, like I knew how bad all the alternatives were. You know, the juices have so much sugar in them. The sodas either have high fructose corn syrup, or the diet sodas are using my minerals in my bones to be digested. So that's not a good alternative. So it doesn't really leave you a lot of very, you know, healthy alternatives. So I got used to water. Um, I just want to say one thing. We're giving so much information here. Don't expect to remember all this. You may, but, but you know, for me, if I were sitting over there listening to this, I'd figure if I got three things to take home with me, I'd be doing really well. Um, so the, the purpose of this presentation is to give you a feel for the range 
of possible things. So that if you know somebody, or you start to see your own symptoms, because I've been dealing with symptoms myself for quite a while, um, just to know, don't give up. There's so many ways in which it's possible that what you're putting in your mouth or this sitting in your kitchen is part of the problem. Find that and that particular part of the problem goes away. Most of the people in our film, they had one big problem, right? So when they took care of that, like the mercury or the thyroid, that did it for them. Many people are dealing with several. So one doesn't do the whole job, at least you have, you know you were here, you know there are six more to check out so that you don't have to give up if one thing doesn't work. You know, I would have given an arm to have a, a track like this that we're learning to define just to know that if one thing doesn't work, we got lots of other opportunities. So anyway, and, and, and you had experience with your mother. So you knew all about it. Well, I knew the cost of not doing anything, that's for sure. <laughs> And I watched myself beginning to suffer the same difficulties. It turns out that I have a genetic uh, makeup that makes me a bit more vulnerable than probably you are, Marie. It's Marie? Yeah. Joanne. Joanne, sorry. Sorry. I ha I'm not good back there yet. <laughs> so, um, it, it's, uh, anyway, that's, that's what I want to say. We are keeping the information and we are working hard to make it very available so that if you decide you want to go find it, you, if you don't have a computer, you can go to the library and the librarian will be able to find it with you. You know, it'll be easy. And, um, and we're we also- no problem. You go to the doctor, you tell him something, he immediately sends you for an MRI. So, I mean, there's no problem with seniors. Once you're at a doctor's office, you're out in the field. You have no problem to go. You don't have to go to the library or anything. You're a doctor immediately. Right. If your doctor knows about this stuff, yeah, you tell them something. Many, 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 many doctors know nothing about this. They, they are trained. Many of them are not the conventional many medical things that she's schools. Saying, yes generally I, anyway. do not train in, they don't give training in nutrition. So, well, it's just the way they're trained and a lot of the, the, the schools are supported by pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. That's not the direction they go. They go to let's fix it with a pill. Mm -hmm. But you know, the world has changed also. The world, I mean, let's be honest. I think that's something, I don't, maybe I'm too soon, I'm along the way until you got into your program further. You, you know what, we're almost help? done, yeah. and then I think we should open up for questions, okay. and we'll have a, we'll have a dialogue. Just okay. say about okay. this, yes, mm -hmm. that would be interesting. All right. Hang on, here we go. Okay. 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 So, we can go through this pretty quickly, but we can just tell you that there are many prescription medications whose side effects, say, cause dizziness, or cause cognitive impairment, or do not operate a vehicle, or that sort of thing. And a lot of times, multiple prescription medications will cause dementia-like symptoms. Um, in addition, I mean, we saw Dr. Graveline, he was a NASA astronaut, and on Lipitor, he would get amnesia, which was, in some people it mimics dementia and Alzheimer's, and so he was able to identify what it was. I mean, he knew, being a doctor, that it was a drug reaction. And he's written books about it. Um, you know, he brought this to a lot of people's attention. Now, of course, Lipitor is still on the market, as are other statins, and we're learning that they are giving many, many people health problems. What did he take in his place? I don't know what he took in his there, place. There are natural uh, uh, strategies for dealing with very high cholesterol, but what Graveline and some other people have discovered through their research is that the whole idea that cholesterol of, of under 300 contributes to heart disease is misguided. You mean over 300? Under 200. 
you know, Under there's two hundred. The medicine, yeah. I'll give you a the way doctors way. are keeping you. No, the, he's saying the levels are that the doctors are told to guide you keep going down and down and down. And some doctors want your cholesterol at one fifty. Right. So what Jackie is saying is there's almost more evidence that the lower your cholesterol goes, the more likely you are to have problems. Right. And that's the, and that cholesterol levels between 200 and 240, 250 are not so unhealthy. This is very, very controversial, but this is what we're finding out. Right. This is Steve Gottlieb, by the way, another board member. There's two types, though. Um, so they're talking about the total level. Yes, you're right. Yeah. You're right. So take a look at these. Yeah. Two so we just wanted to show you these two studies. Um, people with cholesterol under 200 performed less well than those with cholesterol over 200. And in 2011, there was a study done that women with high cholesterol lived longer and actually had fewer heart attacks. So this whole, it, it's just like fats were, I was saying about coconut oil in the 70s, we sort of have the same thing now with cholesterol, like cholesterol is a really bad, bad thing, but we're finding that the brain needs cholesterol to function properly, and all of these drugs, and all of this emphasis on getting cholesterol very, very low is impacting people's ability to think well. So that's really the, the bottom line. Um, and you know, the alert on, on the bottom, I mean, it's, this is, it's just so frustrating to hear how many people are on stress, statin drugs. How many um, people are on statin drugs here? You are on statin drugs. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. So it's a very important thing to find out if, if you know, what are your cholesterol levels? Uh, with and without the drug, and, and push your doctor on it. Find out whether, is this really something that you should be doing? Um, there, good for him. Your doctor took you off statin, so that's good to hear. You also need to look at the ratio. He's 90 years old. He took it God bless. <laughs> yeah. So you don't know, and we're not medical people, so we don't know that any particular person should or shouldn't be on it. What we do know is that it's a high risk medication and not just because of the cholesterol part it also has put people in wheelchairs you know so it's very very tricky stuff so if you don't have to be on it why be on it right? she's a cardiologist by the way yeah yeah cool okay all right so and I had mentioned this a little bit earlier about inflammation and low-level infections. Sometimes you know that you have inflamed joints or whatever, or an inflammation in your back, and you, you can feel it. Other times you can't feel inflammation. But inflammation actually is a silent, I won't say a killer, but it, it really creates an environment in your body that allows uh, disease to, to flourish. So you really want to keep your inflammation low. And Maureen was one of these people who, I mean, she actually was in an Alzheimer's study for 18 months. You get that tells you how far gone she was. Um, I mean, she, she, she couldn't do much of anything, and she did try different, um, uh, you know, programs like ozone therapy and detoxification. She changed her diet, and uh, ultimately she regained much of her of her function. Yeah, and also inflammation, your favorite foods may be the very culprit that makes your body hurt because of inflammation. So, you know, stuff like that, part of, she was one of the people who had several different factors operating. And so changing her diet meant eliminating those inflammatory substances. And you know, a lot of times it's dairy and wheat uh, today that cause inflammation in the body. And we know, for instance, like I've worked with people with lupus, and there are certain foods that if you eliminate from their diet, they feel a whole lot better. Or rheumatoid arthritis. There are foods that contribute to that, and when you eliminate them, you can feel so much better. And there are lifestyle choices that you can make. So you don't necessarily have to be on medication for the rest of your life or even at all if you have 
if you do a little research and get some help to figure out what's really going on, don't, don't just treat the symptoms, but really find out what the cause is of, of what's ailing you. Um, what, why don't we skip over? Okay. Yeah, I think well, the one thing I want to say about this woman, she's another one where it was a multiple causes. Mm -hmm. She was 92 when she was diagnosed. And she was declared incompetent by the court, put under her son's guardianship, and within, I think it was a year or a year and a half later, the court returned her full guardianship, her full authority over her own finances. So this stuff works, and she did about six different things, but she never gave up, and her son was just a real tiger doing this stuff. So you're not necessarily ever too old for this. Okay. All right, we've done this. I mentioned gluten and dairy, you know, wheat and dairy, sugar. Just go back one second, Jackie, to that one. Um, food allergies, a lot of people have sensitivities now to foods because of a whole bunch of issues. I mean, there's GMOs and they're sprayed, and I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but don't know it. So people have digestive discomfort, feel bloating, don't know why. Sometimes it's these things. So you've seen kind of our list. These are the things that we, that we talk about. The last one is stress. And I think we all know that under stress, no one thinks really clearly. Like if you have a lot going on, you have a lot on your mind, you've, you've uh, experienced something um, traumatic. It could be um, a divorce or it could be a loss, you know, of a loved one. Um, relocation, financial changes uh, in your situation. It just creates physical changes in your body that contribute to mental disruption and confusion. And I had mentioned earlier, um, my dad was 85 when my mom died, and they had traveled a lot, but my mom always made every uh, reservation and, and you know made the lodging and everything like that. And the first trip that he took after she passed away, he became disoriented, and he was actually going out to California where my sister lives, and he, instead of meeting her, he didn't know what to do. He rented a car, he was going out to a dental meeting, and long story short, my sister was worried when they finally kind of made contact and took him to a hospital, and they diagnosed him with dementia, and then he came back to New York where he was living, and my brother took him to the NYU Memory Center, and they diagnosed him with early stage Alzheimer's. So he was diagnosed, put on Aricet, which didn't do any good. I would say that within six months, he was fully back to being fully himself. He had just been suffering from grief. No one ever did a, a history with him to find out that his wife had died, and that he had never been responsible for making those arrangements, and he was out of his element. And so these things can happen to people, then they get the diagnosis, then they're put into an institution. It's terrible what can happen sometimes with diagnoses that aren't accurate. So I just encourage you all to be, to be open-minded um, and to know that in a lot of cases, something can be done. I, I want to make sure we have time for questions and answers. Okay. So we do we have this on a piece of paper, this word of wisdom? Okay. So and, and if we don't, I'll make sure. Okay. So Jackie had said earlier, you know, this is a lot of information and it is overwhelming. So we do have a sheet that sort of tells you where you might want to start if you wanted to just start addressing some of these things. But we will get that to you. And in the meantime, I think it's a good time to take some questions. Right. Okay. I yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on your 92-year-old that was diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, whatever, uh, and recovered in two months? No, no, no. Okay. no. Not two months. It was about a year, between a year and a year and a half. Oh, it said two months up there. I saw I saw Two months. So oh, wow. Symptoms were gone. I, I believe she was then misdiagnosed. I can't believe that that could no. be. No, we agree with you. I, I, think, check that. I think a lot of the diagnoses are incorrect. Absolutely. I mean, you're going to find that if you go and you 
you know, if we did a survey of all the people in America who are diagnosed with dementia and Alzheimer's, we know that a lot of the diagnoses are not correct. First of all, I don't, I just, I don't disagree with you with the vitamins and all that. That plays a big part in everyone's life for many, many diseases. However, um, these people that we saw here that were all reversed, I didn't see anyone that was paralyzed, had trouble swallowing, not walking as symptoms. Uh, my husband's in a unit with 31 people. And everyone is entirely different, but it's not like this, really. Actually, it's am. more it physical things. Um, of, of maybe, uh, well, my husband was diagnosed with, um, um, uh, with Parkinson's dementia, okay? And it, what it was, was it looked like he started with uh, Parkinson's. But it's not, he doesn't have Parkinson's. And now he's advancing quite rapidly. So to but everyone has severe disability. Understand. Not like this, just mental. Well, Anne was sent home on hospice and she couldn't move. She was ab absolutely on her deathbed, as it were. And she actually was brought back. So we, we have at least one example of someone like that. But I'm not saying that, I mean, we, we, we are not saying that everyone can be, but things like Parkinson's, MS, other ALS, ALS people have been able to reverse their symptoms. And it's very much the same protocol as what we're talking about today. These are all neurological diseases. So, ALS, there's no cure for ALS. Well, fine. Well, that's the same thought that uh, we're talking about. The general theory is that there's no cure for Alzheimer's. And what we're finding is that you will see, if you go through this presentation again, that almost everybody we talked to was diagnosed by medical professionals as having some form of dementia or Alzheimer's. Now, whether or not it was true or not doesn't make a difference. The fact that they restored their life, got their cognition back, is what we're trying to help you understand. Yeah. They also have nutritionists that are, have very good backgrounds and uh, they're well into aware of what people were eating before and uh, there's a lot being learned now that it, it's very important to know that they're you know one of the things we look at is everybody's doing their best you know they're really doing the best with what they've been taught with what they know with what they're able to discover if you're a doctor who has been trained in the medical model forever you've never had any real um, direction nutritionally, you don't know about food allergies like we're talking about here that are bad enough to make you lose your mind. You just don't know about it, so you don't believe it until it's, it's shown. But we, here's the point. The point is nobody knows what the disease is. What, you, what they know is you can't remember shit. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Excuse my, excuse my friend. But you can see that. But, so we know something's amiss. Is it Alzheimer's? Nobody knows. If you go on the internet and you look up a definition of Alzheimer's and you go to 20 websites, you will get 18 or 20 different definitions. So they're still struggling. Everybody's still struggling. The main thing is there are lots of causes. And the training that we have so far on the whole doesn't give, people, give doctors a clue. Absolutely. But here's the great news. There's a guy named Perlmutter in Florida. He is a neurologist and has, I think he's a fellow of the American Nutritional something. Anyway, he's got as big a degree in nutrition as he does in neurology. And he just wrote a book called Brain Brain. And his belief is that a great deal of what we're dealing with has to do with diet and, and specifically wheat. Mm -hmm. And he, he says, he's one of the foremost people on ALS in the country, he says he's got something like a 25% cure rate. And he has five new ALS patients a week coming wow. to him. So there are people in little pockets here and there who are finding stuff out that our, our blindness to anything outside the uh, medical, mm -hmm. it's just kept us unaware of it. But there's a whole new wave of innovation and discovery that is happening. And 
And I feel really lucky for my own self to be in on it because I'm not forgetting as much as I was a year and a half ago. I mean, I was scared to death. And now I know it may be a lot of work to get it, you know, and figure out and give up some of my favorite foods, but I know I can keep my brains, that I've got at least an 80% chance of staying uh, co cogent, you know, <coughs> competent is the word I was looking for. It does come up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. At this point right now, she, can't, she does not speak, she does not walk, mm -hmm. she does not feed her stuff. Mm -hmm. She's in a wheelchair. We put her in assisted living before she got to the stage that she is right now. She's still in assisted living, but she's in Sunrise. I don't know what you heard, Sunrise. Yeah. She was in the independent care because we saw that she was starting to lose her and she was diagnosed with initial stage, early stage dementia. But the doctor was saying, the neurologist was saying, all the surgeries that she had over her lifespan, every time you go underneath anesthesia, it puts your brain cells to sleep. And sometimes it don't come back. And so that's basically, we noticed, like after her last surgery, when she, she had breast cancer three times. And when last two years ago, she had a mastectomy. And then we noticed that she was going down faster. Last year, she ended up, a doctor took her off of her blood pressure medication, and she ended up with congestive heart conditions. She ended up in the hospital, and now she's completely gone. She doesn't know her name. She doesn't, her birthday was last week. Her 87th birthday was last week. She didn't even know it was her birthday. You know, so I don't know how true that is about the brain cells dying with surgery, but um, geez, I know Alzheimer's is a devastating disease. Absolutely. That's why we're doing what we're doing, because it is devastating, and there are people who will not be able to be brought back. There are. And we, we understand that. Um, you look at all the concussions, you know, the, the NFL, and all of these men. Uh, many of them are getting Alzheimer's disease in their in their 60s and 70s from having been hit so many times and in, in, in the brain and I mean so so there are a lot of different different examples and I'm sorry I'm sorry it sounds like she's been through so much and obviously your family's been through so much yes. I have a question. Oh, hang on we got a question right over here be with uh, the wheat. I just want to know why wheat is bad now. Because they always say wheat is better than the white bread. They have wheat bread instead of white bread. So why is wheat White bread is wheat bread. Right, but wheat bread, she's saying, is not necessarily white bread. So, so this is interesting. So wheat, the issue is the quality of the wheat. It's, it's the grain itself. Now, sometimes it's the way it's processed. Like most of the, um, like if Pepperidge Farm or Arnold or a lot of those, I mean, even if you have whole wheat bread, if you look at the ingredients, you can find sugar in it, you can find some other things that aren't so healthy. The, the, the major part of the issue is the quality of the grain today. It's actually from, from the seeds that it's grown from. It's not the same wheat that people were eating even 50 years ago. And it's become more and more denatured as a food. And it's causing lots of intestinal issues because, because it's different. And it's being, the wheat is being sprayed or it's being treated a certain way. And people are having a lot of problems digesting it. Not just wheat, but all the gluten um, uh, grains. There's you know barley. For some people, barley. There's spelt. There's um, you know, rot. Right. So, and, and it's not only in your food. Gluten is used as an ingredient in cosmetics, <coughs> adhesives, in skin, in personal products that you put on all of the time. If you can get coconut oil through your skin, you can certainly get gluten. Yeah, so, so, so there, even for people who are avoiding gluten, it's everywhere. And uh, this fellow, Perlmutter in Florida, he's not sure about this, but he said based on his practice, it looks like a, a much broader um, uh, part of the population 
is allergic enough to wheat to, uh, for it to be, he takes almost every patient off wheat, puts them on a wheat-free diet, and he says the kind of miracles that happen when he does that, they happen every day in his office. People coming in saying, since I went off wheat, I can remember. Since I went off wheat, I don't have any stomach pain anymore. So, you know, it goes on and on. I have uh, two questions. One about the coconut. What about the fruit itself, coconut? The, you know, you, can you, it, um, is it the same? You're not going to derive the same benefits okay. from eating the fruit as you do using the oil. But it's not uh, a bad. I mean, it doesn't, is it a lot of calories? Is it, because at one time they said coconut was fattening and, uh, you know. No, I don't think it's particularly bad. You know, coconut's probably better for some people than others, but in and of itself, I don't think it's, it's a particularly harmful food. Because I have a friend who's a diabetic for many, many, many years, and she started to use this. She said you could use it in your hair. Very good for dry skin, especially. And I just saw that when it was put on my hands, because I have very dry skin. And it, it feels like new. Mm -hmm. And I, the other question I have is you were talking about caffeinated. And you said, you know, coffee, tea. But if you drink the caffeinated tea, mm -hmm. is that okay? I mean, I drink a lot of water. I love water. But if you drink a decaffeinated tea, like for instance, yes, um, that's okay. lemon with yes. ginger, yes. or. It's fine. Herbal, herbal teas and decaffeinated teas are much better. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. When you say wheat-free, does that mean gluten-free? So wheat is only one of the glutinous grains. But wheat is actually one that gives the most people problems. So it, it's just sort of like wheat is a subset of gluten. There are other glutinous grains to, you know, that some people have problems with if they have problems with gluten. Like barley, for instance, or spelt. You can see some of these other grains in the, in the markets. I thought it was gluten-free was mostly for celiac uh, Celiac, yes. So, celiac. so let me just explain the difference. So if you're celiac, it means that you have an actual autoimmune reaction to gluten. But there are many people in the population who, like me, I'm gluten-free. I don't have celiac. I don't have an autoimmune reaction. I have a digestive reaction. When I eat gluten, especially wheat, I am bloated. I, uh, I, I sometimes have terrible stomach cramps. It, it just, my whole elimination changes. It just, it just mucks up the works. It just does not do well in my in my body, and I know a lot of my clients feel like that as well. So that's the distinction between gluten free and celiac. Thank you. Celiac, you have to be very careful because if your if your body thinks that wheat is actually a bacteria or an invader that needs to be you know done in, the kind of the kind of attack that it mounts is is tremendous. I mean, you're talking about your white blood cells, and you're talking about a lot of activity that causes inflammation in the body. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's extreme. Um, but, you know, weed allergies aren't fun either, so. Um, other questions? When you talk about inflammation, is a CRPC reactive protein, uh, C reactive protein? Yes, C-reactive protein is usually on a blood panel, and it usually does signal uh, inflammation. It is one of the markers that all traditional doctors have been taught to use. But unfortunately, it's not the only one. So yes, it's, it's, it's one of them. But if someone is testing negative to C-reactive protein and yet still has lots of other symptoms, then, you know, I think it's incumbent upon doctors to look further, and many times they don't, because they don't know where to look. They haven't, again, been taught 
uh, about nutrition or about food sensitivities or allergies. Um, but they're learning. Yes, there was a are. huge conference in New York just this past weekend where Dr. Perlmutter and another fellow named Mark Hyman and so on, they were featured uh, sharing what they have learned stepping outside of the medical box, you know, as it's been defined. And there were folks there just lapping it up of medical, medical people. So there's, there's a hunger to be able, I think, to, go, to be able to go back to the place where you practice medicine as a, uh, as a calling, as a, you know, as a do no harm and do some good and, you know, be part of the healing process. Um, yeah. Um, I know all this information you're giving us on nutrition and all that, but how do you determine the difference between Alzheimer and dementia? There are two separate ones. Uh, Alzheimer's. I've gone to several seminars over the several years, and uh, my father was 90 years old. I took him to a neurologist. And he questioned me, did all these kind of tests. He said, your father does not have the big A. Your father has senile dementia. Right. That's so, another type. Yeah, that's another type. But most people are just, just because you're getting senile dementia, and say, oh, they have Alzheimer's. They have Alzheimer's. That's and exactly what happens. And it's, it's bad. It's not accurate, and it misleads because people think dementia equals Alzheimer's equals incurable, and then they stop looking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're right on. But how do you determine, I mean, how do you, um, I had heard that a lot of Alzheimer's start with younger people. Not younger people, you know, in their 50s, and they go through plateaus, uh, different uh, stages of that. And while one is going through this plateau, the senile dementia is coming up slowly. And then they kind of both meet. You know, that's why they have, in nursing homes and all, they have the Alzheimer and dementia unit together. Right. Because they don't know. Here's the thing. Alzheimer's still is only definitively diagnosed, according to whatever definition you're using, on autopsy. They're not going to know until the end. So the question is, what are the symptoms and what alleviates them? So define, define uh, dementia, that is the early stages that goes into Alzheimer's? Dementia no. is cognitive dysfunction. It's the okay. big umbrella okay. that covers anything where there is an inability of the brain to live, it interferes with normal life. Sometimes it's progressive, sometimes it's not. The Alzheimer definition is progressive. It gets worse and worse till you're gone, right? But uh, other types, uh, maybe it's an injury or something, they've got dementia, but they're as bad as they're going to get, and it's just going to be that way. So, so there are different types, but dementia is the accurate term for the symptomology of cognitive dysfunction. In the old days, it was all dementia. MRI or something that they said they can see the brain and they can see the activity where it could possibly uh, show you that the person has Alzheimer's. Right. The difficulty is, you know those plaques and tangles that are supposed to be the definitive yes. thing? They're not even sure whether that's an effect or a cause. There are people who have plaques and tangles in their brains who do not have Alzheimer's disease. And, and again, they're doing research on that right now, we know, at Columbia. Th th these are very good questions. The point is, is that nobody really understands that. So we're trying to demystify the understanding that if somebody says it's Alzheimer's, you can't do anything about it. And as Jackie said, we're dealing here with the symptoms of dementia, whether it's an Alzheimer's or anything else. If you know someone who is suffering, whether they've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, from any kind of cognitive impairment, it might be worth looking into these other issues to see if their symptoms can improve as opposed to just understanding it's Alzheimer's and there's nothing you can do about it. That's really the whole story. Are there other questions? Years ago, they did nothing for dementia. I want to say one other thing. One other thing I want to say about this. Um, 
um, Faye. Faye just said her husband has vascular dementia. There is a doctor in California who says he has never come across a cardiovascular patient he couldn't turn around. Now, does that mean he could turn around vascular dementia? I don't know, but I'd be following that up because what it looks like is that a good deal of what's going on with this tidal wave of dementia is lifestyle-based. It's stuff that has to do with our environment, with our diet, um, maybe with our fear and our mistreatment of it, certainly with our overuse of medications. You know, there are a bunch of controllable factors. So um, the trying to nail a diagnosis when you haven't checked out all those factors is just guessing. So the patient's now two years ago. This is what's diagnosed and all right, it, are there any other questions? Because if not, I think um, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us today. I will stay for a while if you want if you have other questions. Oh, one other thing. We also can use volunteers for all kinds of things. So if you are looking for something to do with your spare time, and especially if you have skills, but even if you don't, and you want to come take a look and see where you might be able to, to, to lend a hand, please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again. Thank you again, Jack. Very interesting presentation. And I think we have some materials to hand out. And, uh,